want to uh, I want to do a little bit of I'm not going to do a lot of review, but I want to say something I said on um, Sunday that children are a reflection of their parents. Um, you know, I'm not the first one to come up with that uh, slow, that thing, that saying. Um, but I, I was talking to somebody today, and it brought some things to mind. And you know, uh, Revelation's progressive. You get more and more as you go. And I want to make sure that when I say stuff like that, it's not bringing uh, anybody to think that they've done a bad job because their kid did something wrong or, or whatever. Because uh, usually what I'm, when I'm talking about that kind of thing, you just see some kids that are unruly. I mean, they're just unruly in their actions. They're disrespectful to adults. They don't seem to have any honor. And I don't ever look at children and say it's their fault. It's, uh, it's the fault of their parents because they haven't raised them. Because, uh, you know, let's just face it. It's hard to raise kids. And especially it's hard to raise them right. I mean, you can raise kids and they turn out okay, but to take the time and, and go through discipline, go through teaching, go through admonition, to sit them down and explain things to them, to listen to them. It takes time and it takes effort and a lot of patience too. And so I want to make sure that when I say that, I'm not, I'm not saying that if your kid's done something wrong that you're a bad parent, not by a long stretch because if that was true, I'd be the worst out there. Um, you know, our children have done things they shouldn't have done and gone places they shouldn't have done and all that, but it doesn't mean I'm a bad parent. It means that at, there comes a point in time in life when uh, teenagers and stuff start making their own decisions. Right. And um, my, uh, I'll tell you, just I'll tell on me. Um, I, the last time I got a whooping, anybody, does anybody know what whooping is? Yes, okay, yeah, we're in Texas, so I figure people, people know what that means. Um, I got my last whooping, <laughs> and I remember it well, when I was 17 years old. Before you laugh, and you know, uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm not the only one, but there were, oh, we got another, we got a taker. Um, you, know, you know, there's something interesting about this. One, I said a word in front of my mother that was unacceptable in our house. Now, you got to understand that when you are in someone's house or even the house of God, you abide by the rules of the house. You don't make up your own. I was talking to just the same person today and said, you know, they were in the military. Well, they didn't go into the military and tell them how it was going to be done. Uh, you won't, you'll either, one, you'll be in the brig or you're going to be kicked out with the dishonorable. Why? Because they have a set of rules that you abide by. And so I did not abide by those rules with my, and my dad. And my, I remember uh, the look on my dad's face when I said it and I knew something bad was about to happen at a ripe old age of 17. And so I went in and uh, I put my hands on the chair and I remember those last three licks of my life. And, uh, you know, and so, but, you know, the surprising thing is I was 17 year old, 17 years old and still submitted to my father. Uh, it wasn't out of fear. It wasn't out of dread. It was out of a healthy respect for him, who he was, how he decided my mother should be honored. And, uh, and so I, I did, and, you know, and, um, but I just, I just want you to know that, you know, every, every parent makes mistakes. Nobody's got it all together, but we should be progressively getting better, right? Amen. We should be learning more, shouldn't we? Amen. You know, so that we can be better as we go. You know, the best way to learn is from somebody else's mistakes, not your own. Yeah right? Uh, experience is not the best teacher. Trust me, it's not the best teacher. Uh, you know, I would, the, the things that we happen to have gone through with our son, I pray and believe that nobody else experienced that, that they would learn from, you know, from, from our mistakes or, or maybe from how we handled it. I don't know. But anyway, um, let's, uh, let's get ready to get into the word tonight. Anybody want to get into the word? All right, uh, before we do, let me read some funny things to you. Since school started back today, I figured it would be appropriate to, to read some funny things kids say. Uh, before we do it, let's pray, and I'll ask forgiveness in advance. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this night. Give you praise, Lord, and honor, and thank you for progressive revelation. Thank you for learning more and more about who you are, how you act, and how you expect us to act, Father. We want to be and do everything you've called us to be and do so that we can propagate, we can bring your kingdom into the earth, that we can see heaven rain down on earth through us. And we just thank you for that. As we've been talking about honor and humility, Lord, these things are close to your heart. 
and believe that we would uh, be ready to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just say this with me. My mind is open to receive, my mind is open to receive. and my heart to, understand. my heart to understand. All right. Okay, here we go on some funny things. I went to see a mortgage advisor with my seven-year-old son. As I sat down at the desk, my son sat down and said to the man, Hello, I am not her husband. Okay. Okay, there's some I can't read. There's one that if you'll allow me a little irreverence, I would like to read. You know, um, God made the body, in case you didn't know. And uh, th th there's different names to different parts on the body. And uh, just because we're in church doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to say those names as long as they're not slang. Isn't that right? Okay, I'm getting mixed reviews on this one. Um, my five-year-old said, can I have a Twix? Me, I said, you mean a Twix? She said, no, I only want one. Okay, wow. Come on, Elsa, get it together. My almost three-year-old said this to her doll who kept falling over. <laughs> the soccer coach, when you're trying to score a goal, kick the ball with the laces of your shoes. My four-year-old daughter says, um, we're in preschool. There's only Velcro walking around here. <laughs> All right. Here it is. Okay. Let me just say, oh, boy, I don't know if I should. Mm. It's really funny. My son walks up to me with his hands dangling under his chin, fingers spread out, wiggling around. Son says, Mom, you like my beard of testicles? I, I said, what? Beard of what? My son, beard of testicles. I'm an octopus. Me, me, tentacles, kiddo. They're called tentacles. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> that wasn't that bad, right? Are we streaming? We are. All right. Last one. I sat down with my three-year-old daughter who was playing at her dollhouse. I asked her which doll I could be, and she replied, the one that does dishes. <laughs> Smart girl. I am. You're going to ask a question, you're going to get an answer. All right. Uh, let's go to Philippians, and we're going to start in Philippians 2, Mike. Um, and I want to, uh, the last few weeks I've been talking about humility, the humility of grace, and uh, we're going to see in, in James in just a second where it says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace, more and more grace to the humble. And so if you learn how to walk in a greater level of humility in your life, you'll learn or you will be able to receive greater power to do what God's called you to do because grace is power. Grace is the empowerment to do right. It's, you know, some people say grace is the empowerment not to sin. Well, that's kind of negative. It's the empowerment to do right. Grace is available to do what we could never measure up to the law trying to do. I, I spoke to somebody uh, recently who was in a Messianic church, Messianic Jewish, and she asked me because of my tattoos, I have a lot of Jewish stuff on me, and she asked me if I was Messianic. And I said, well, I'm, I'm Jewish by blood. And she said, oh, you're grafted. And I said, yeah, that's right. So grafted in just means I was a sinner and now I've been saved by grace. But um, she was talking to me about how she was raised up to the level or to the age of 15. Uh, she was in a Messianic church and then she finally left and she never went back. And she said it was because that it got so controlling, it got so uh, constrictive. And the, the truth is that without grace and salvation, life's horrible. It's just even under the law, even under without the blood of Jesus, um, <laughs> I just thank you, Lord, someday for a building with great insulation that cannot be heard a motorcycle going out there or a gang of mo motorcycles anyway. Um, but without grace, uh, we are destined to fail. Right. And uh, we're destined to not live out the life that God has predetermined and made ready for us to live, as yeah. Ephesians 2.10 says. All right, so in, we've been talking about this and how to walk in greater humility. And so the best, how many of you believe the best example for humility is Jesus? Yeah. 
yeah. right? We can get an agreement with that. Now, tonight, I'm not going to read anything to you. I'm not going to propose anything to you. It's not in the Bible. But I can tell you what I've been talking about on Sundays and what I've been talking about on uh, Wednesdays has been, has been received with mixed reviews. Uh, some people don't like it. Some people don't talk, like me talking about honor because what it does is sometimes the word hurts. Uh, and it hurts in a good way. How many of you know if you had a cancer uh, and you, they said, well, we can do surgery and we can cut it out and it'll be gone, you know, that would be a good idea rather than saying, no, I don't want the pain of recovery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because one is going to let you live longer and one's going to kill you sooner. And sometimes, and I'm not saying, well, I am saying that the world and uh, pride and dishonor and disrespect are cancers. That if not, if they go unchecked, they'll grow in us and they'll produce for us a horrible life. Yeah. Uh, it's especially important that we remember to, to teach our children these things because, you know, I, um, and I'm thankful that, that we have a lot of respectful kids, but then, you know, we have, we, we had a lot of kids in that, that are still learning. I won't say they're disrespectful. I'll just say they're still learning. And, um, you know, it's important that as a church that we hold a bar or standard high for honor and respect. Yeah. That we say this is how we are, this is how we operate, so on and so forth. Yeah. And so um, it's important that we learn more about these things so that we can walk in a greater depth of relationship. Amen. God is all about relationship. I don't think, don't think by what I'm talking about one second that he's not. But in every relationship, there are boundaries in every relationship, there is respect and honor. Yeah. There should be. And if you don't have those things, then you don't have a very good relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Is it true? Yeah. I mean, if, if I was, and I'll tell on myself, okay? So as we've been talking about honor, uh, the Lord's been revealing things to me in my life, and I asked him, I said, what revealed to me things that I need to fix in my life? And I told on Sunday about you know, an outburst I had because I dropped my apples on the floor, and um, but I'm not going to repeat that today. And so he also said he wanted me to clean up my language in church, and uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound good. If it's your first time here, welcome. Uh, I don't get up here and just start cussing or anything, but I but I have gotten to the brink before. And uh, the Word of God, uh, this is a you know this is a holy tree stand, and uh, I don't like pulpits, but this serves a purpose. So. Um, especially the acrylic ones. You remember those, the ones you can see through? I always think that that's really bad, especially if you forget to, you know, close your barn door, you know, because <laughs> it sees right through and you got issues. But um, I, I think that um, in my life, in an effort to be relevant or to be funny or to be righteously indignant is what I would probably try to call it, I've gone to the edge of some things that I shouldn't go to the edge on because if, if you just keep doing it, eventually you're going to fall off the edge. And so I, I don't want to do that. But here was the thing. I told Amy last night we were talking, and um, I said, um, and I didn't, you know, my pride, uh, and, I, and I'd say it's mine. It belongs to the enemy, but, I, but I've taken some of it on, and I'm having to get it out of my life because we'll all be dealing with pride till the day we die. Um, I told her last night that for a long time, well, probably for the past three years, you know, we really, and I'm not going to say that this is the fault of any certain stream or anything else, but we followed uh, uh, an apostolic movement really hard and that's why you see people painting and that's the Lord really opened some things up to us uh, different expressions of Holy Spirit that I was too controlling to ever let come out before and it's helped make us into we, who we are but where I came from in the word of faith movement honor and respect were highly regarded and sometimes uh, it was overboard in other words it was became about works it became about uh, what you did and how you looked and all that kind of stuff. And that's just as wrong as walking in disrespect or dishonor for people. But as we pressed in hard over these things for the past three years, what I noticed is that I wasn't pressing in, continuing to press in into faith hard and honor hard and to get pride out of my life hard uh, because they weren't uh, something that I was reminding myself of. And so it's my fault, but I just didn't see it uh, they, they approach it different ways. And so I think that you have to take everything together. I think that you have to put it all together. You can't just take, say, well, they're right and they're wrong and they're wrong. You know, you have to put it all together and then you get harmony. And uh, instead of just uh, going after one thing or seeing one thing, wouldn't it be good if 
Uh, we just sought the word out, and what the word said, we did. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, we've been talking about how to walk in greater humility. And, uh, and I'm thankful for all the lessons I've learned in the past three years. It's really helped me. And, uh, and anyway, so Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, it was also in Christ Jesus, who being, who being in the form of God did not consider... Uh, okay, where... What are we going? Okay. Therefore, God also is highly... Ex Wait, go back. We started too soon. Five. We're in five. Cinco. Glory. That... Is this screen changing colors? God, man, that's irritating. All right. <laughs> Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus... Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of what? No, no reputation, taking him in the form of a bondservant, becoming the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Okay, if you go back to uh, verse 7, it said, but he, he made himself of no reputation. Now, what I want to say to you in this scripture is that you can become in the earth just like Jesus was, but you'll have to follow the principles of that he sat down. And he says that he made of himself no reputation. In other words, he didn't try to make it about him. He made it about the Father. And when he made it about the Father, the Father highly exalted him. So if we want to see ourselves, if we want to be exalted, and I don't mean that in a prideful way, but if we want to come up in the earth, we're going to have to follow the way Jesus did it because it says in the Word that he was meek and humble. Yeah. He came to serve, not to be served. But how many of you know, you, I heard, uh, heard this recently in a message, if you show, if you sow the respect, wait, if you sow the respect that you owe, you'll reap the, if you give the respect that you owe, you'll reap the respect that you sow. Right. Oh, okay, that's good. If you give humility, you'll reap humility from others. If you give honor, you'll reap honor, Right? Luke 6, 36 through 38 says, Given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over some men, give it unto your bosom. And it does, it's not just money. A lot of people, a lot of pastors use that for money, and it can be, but it's not just that. Amen. It's honor, it's respect, it's mercy, it's humility. As we learn to sow those things in our life, then we'll reap those things. And I forgot to tell on myself. And so we're standing back there, and uh, the, my pride did not want people to know that we were living in a fifth wheel right now. Uh, because, you know, people will think weird things and who's going to want to have a pastor that lives in the fifth wheel and all that kind of stuff, God forbid. But, you know, it's our choice to do what we believe we're supposed to do. And if God's on it, then it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it, right? Amen. And we try to be transparent and real before everybody. And so uh, I had to shoot that pride cow and drop it dead uh, when Amy put it on Insta Story, and, uh, and, and I didn't know about it. And then somebody asked me about my new home on wheels. And so... Uh, um, but, you know, pride's really a tricky thing for guys. Um, yesterday, I tried to move the house uh, <laughs> with my truck, and I forgot to lock in the, the hub. And so the truck moved. The fifth wheel did not. It stayed, and then when it did not have anything to support it, it fell on the tailgate of my truck. And so my truck is now at Campbell's receiving medical attention. Uh, <laughs> And so, and I got really, Amy was standing there when it happened, and I hear this loud, bam. Oh, God. What has, I knew what had happened. I got out, and so I had to lift it, figure out how to get it off and everything. I'll never make that mistake again. Thankfully, it wasn't that much damage. But pride would say, pride would get mad at Amy for trying to comfort me. It's true. Men are worse about this than women. We do something that we know was stupid, and they try to be nice to us, and then we start attacking them for some odd reason when they don't even deserve it. Now, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I was just like, 
leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. Let me, let me get through this. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. I'm just, I'm trying to be good, you know. Uh, we were standing, I, I was on the tractor a lot yesterday. I was scraping ground and we we're going to put some grass down and stuff like that. And as we were standing there, when I'm outside and I'm sweating a lot and whatever, and I, I used to, when I went to school, uh, Bible school, to a little hick Bible school, I, uh, you know, I was dipping and doing stuff a Bible student shouldn't do. And so I got in the habit of spitting. So, uh, and, and I know that, don't, don't anybody take my revelation upon yourself, okay, and say that you have to do this. I mean, of course, I don't, you know, tobacco in your lips, not, it's never been proven to help you. Uh, <laughs> the other side. Anyway, uh, but I'm not saying condemnation on anybody or anything else. I got my own stuff I'm dealing with, but um, not that in particular, but because um, then people start wondering, well, what are you dealing with? Well, it's none of your business. And so, uh, but I spit, and I was spitting around Amy, and, uh, and, and, uh, and all of a sudden I got this prick in my heart that said, quit that. She's a lady. Now, not once in our marriage has she ever spit around me. Aren't you, aren't you glad to hear that? <laughs> that the first lady doesn't spit anyway. <laughs> that's something that, that's big in black churches. The, the pastor's wife is the first lady of the church. Anyway, but they do a lot of good things and that, that's an honor, a place of honor and respect. But anyway, and so I told her, I said, oh God, I'm going to quit doing that. I don't want to spit around you anymore. And then we get over here and I, and I, and I oh God, quit that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I started getting under condemnation about it. Well, I mean, and she's like, Barry, you've kind of done it for a long time, just baby steps. <laughs> and so, but as we talk about these things, the Lord may prick your heart. He may say, hey, you know, uh, don't do that around your wife or don't do that around your, your children. Or, uh, you know, there's other bodily functions I could talk about that I won't go into completely that maybe should not be done around your wife or your children. Um, be, amen, she says, <laughs> because cause it's just wrong. You shouldn't do it. I mean, and so, well, what's the big deal? It's just gas. It's a big deal, especially if it stinks. I mean, have you ever, have you ever been around somebody and it happened, you were just like, man, that was wonderful. That was just glorious. I mean, it smells like potpourri. Most likely, you know, uh, I, okay, I'm going to move. I'm going to move on. But, you know, we need to ask ourselves those questions. Uh, because the truth is, you know, Amy is, she's my princess. She's who's God, who's God has blessed me with. Each one of you wives are, were God's gift to your husband. Uh, what? Why are you laughing? Oh, it's just, I mean, but it's true. Um, we should, you know, if, if you were, just think back. Um, when you were being courted or dated or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, guys usually are on their best behavior. Why? Because they're, they have a goal. And, <laughs> and all those goals aren't good. But you don't want to do anything to mess up your goal. And so you wouldn't spit around her or you wouldn't kiss her with a mouthful of snuff or you wouldn't uh, do the other thing. And, but somehow after we get a ring on their finger, we think, eh, what's the big deal? <coughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Let this mind be in you. And I'm just, it's, but it, these, these things are true, and, uh, but I know that there's some people that don't like it, but that's too bad because it's in the Bible. And you say, well, where is farting in the Bible where you shouldn't do it around your wife? 1 Corinthians 13. It doesn't have the word in there, but it does say, think of others before you think of yourself. It does say, walk in love. It does say, don't think of what you just want to do, but those around you. So it's included. All right, 1 John. <laughs> All right, I'm doing good. Everybody's happy. Nobody's fallen out yet. Ooh. 1 John 3, 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Wow. Uh, I didn't write this. This is like really in the Bible. He who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this 
we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? This is really good. It's just talking to greed. It's talking to selfishness bound up in your heart because if you're selfish in your heart, you're going to be selfish in your life. And that's just, it's part of pride. Now go to John 15, 13. John 15, 13. Oh, yeah, John 15, 13. This is my commandment that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. You are my friends if you keep on doing what I command you. What would that make you if, what would that make us if we stopped doing what he commanded us? Enemies. I mean, you got to look at the reverse of these two. It says, uh, I don't call you servants because I'm letting you in on what the master is doing. Now, this is a, a, a parable or a, a story Jesus is telling is saying, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends because the friends know what his master is doing. This shows us right here that we can know what God is thinking. We can know what God is doing. Why? Because Jesus knew what God was doing, and we can be just like Jesus. Everybody say, I can be just like Jesus. I can be just like Jesus. My friend, oh, it says, uh, I don't call you servants any longer for certain I know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have revealed to you everything I've heard from my father. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and I've appointed and placed and purposefully planted you so that you would go and bear fruit and keep on bearing, that your fruit may remain and be lasting. So whatever you ask in my father in his name, will be done for you. This is a commandment that I give you, love that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another. What a wonderful, I mean, just like, who, who sings that song? What a wonderful world it would be. But, but that song, come on, come on. Nobody? Is it the Bee Gees or what? <laughs> what a wonderful world it would be. That's the only words I know in the song. Okay, yeah, Google it. Thank you. Finally, Google's doing something good. All right. So, Jesus is saying we have to be self-selfish. But go to the first slide there. When he says go, this is what the word go means. It's hupago in Greek. I go away, depart. It's from the word hypo, which means under, and ago, which means lead away. Property to lead away under someone's authority, mission, or objective. Literally, going under indicates a change of relation, which is only def defined by the context. Jesus is saying in the scripture, do what I tell you to do, and you'll walk in the authority I have. Amen. It's important that we see that. And that word go means to go under or make yourself of no reputation, just like we saw in the previous scripture. Now, go to 1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6. If we want the same lifting up that Jesus got, then we must willingly go low. Amen? Yeah. Okay. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold of eternal life. Now, on eternal life, this is a huge scripture. It's got a lot in it. But the main thing I want you to see is that you don't trust in uncertain riches. You don't trust in those things. But let me ask you, who was this written to? Timothy, for the church. Timothy was a pastor at Ephesus. And so Paul wrote to Timothy so Timothy would tell the church. But I think that probably lots of times when people read this scripture, they don't put themselves in it. Command those who are rich in this present age. And that where he says present age really helps us because it means present age. It doesn't mean in the age to come. It means now. And so this scripture was written to you. This scripture was written to me. But we have to see ourselves as wealthy if we want to manifest wealth. And he said it right there. Those who are rich, it's not spiritual riches. That's not what he's talking about. He's, because if you go on, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. So you look at the context and it's talking about cash. Yeah. You know, people don't like, I'm not even going to say it. Because if you've been coming here long enough, you know I'm going to talk about it. So whatever. Uh, in the, don't be haughty. Why? Because somehow having a lot of cash in your account can make you think you're better than somebody else. Now, this is what you, you remember in the 80s, how many 
uh, televangelists fell. And, and God bless them, some of them have come back up and they've admitted they were wrong and God's promoted them and put them on high again and they're affecting the nations and stuff. But I guarantee you, if you go back to each individual and talk to them, what you'll find is that money ended up changing them in some way. Yeah. It ended up making them think more of themselves than they needed to. Now, God gives us all things richly to enjoy. He wants to do that, but you have to stay in humility to be able to enjoy it. And you have to be in humility to be able to give it away. Yeah, that's right. Amen? Amen. Okay, did I have any Greek on that? I don't, I don't, know, I don't think I did. Okay, now let's go to, uh, I want to skip first, uh, Second Chronicles. We talked about, we're going to go to Proverbs 27. I, I wanted to just briefly tell you that Hezekiah in the Old Testament, how many of you were here last Wednesday night? Gee whiz. Oh, we had a, lo a low Wednesday night last Wednesday then. <clears throat> well, let's, we need to line up online. Go to 2 Chronicles 32. I'm going to do this quickly. Um, Hezekiah, just for a little background, Hezekiah was the king of Israel. And uh, he also, th this was really unique. I learned this from Bill Johnson, that Hezekiah and Isaiah operated in the same timeline. And you know in the word in Revelation it says that we're kings and priests. Well, this was the first uh, operation, positive operation of a king and a priest working well together. And so the king would have dominion over the, over the kingdom, but the priest would feed into the king so the king would know what to do. Okay? And so it wasn't like the king was over the priest unless the king got prideful. Because the king would always know the wisdom I need comes from the priest I have. Yeah, that's right. Okay? Yeah, yeah. We're still in the same operation today. Yeah. Now, you are not any better than me, and I'm not any better than you. But I can tell you, more than likely, if you're in a church and you're not the pastor, you're called to be a king. Amen. Yeah. Right. I figured so I'd get a bigger amen on that. Yeah. You're called to be a king. You're called to be a queen. You're called to be royalty. Why? Because a king, a true king like King Jesus knows the power, the resources he has are there to come up under and help humanity. And yeah. so what kings often do, though, is they start taking everything to themselves. Money changes them and they fall from their kingdom. Yeah. Right. But if they remain open eared to the priest, now I'm not saying I'm a priest. I am in a priesthood, though. Yes. Amen. I'm not your priest. There's only one priest, Jesus Christ. But he has set me in a place of pastorship or uh, ministry or whatever. And so, as you grow in kingship, you should also be growing in your revelation of the priesthood. And so, when I go to God and I ask him, what do you want me to talk about? You have to believe, even though this may hurt, even though it may not be the funnest thing to talk about, pride and honor and all this stuff, it could mean God's setting you up to receive a blessing. Amen. It could mean God is about to exalt you and you need to know how to act when you're exalted. That's so good. Preach it. But if you despise it and you say, well, this is just, I've heard him talk about this before. I'm just, whatever. If you despise it and then, you know, you don't come to service or because you think I'm going to talk about it or whatever, you have deemed yourself unworthy of the exaltation because you're taking light the things of God. Right. Now, I wouldn't say this to somebody who hadn't made this their church home because some people visit and God forbid anybody visit when I'm talking about this. But anyway, you know, but God knows too. Uh, I don't, I, I, and I consider, Amy and I consider this a, an honor to be able to, to, to lead this church and uh, everything we're doing. So all that to say, Hezekiah came in and he, um, Solomon, who was the king, I don't know how many, about 300 years before Hezekiah, uh, Solomon sent Israel into a tailspin of disaster because of his affection for women and uh, to bring, he brought heathen nations in and took harems and took concubines and took wives. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I think that's what it was. So a thousand women. Uh, you're going to have issues. <laughs> and I don't even think you have to be a, you know, spirit, Holy Spirit filled or led to know that. You're just, you're going to have issues. You know, I, I see these 
stupid shows, Sister Wives, and I don't watch them. I've never seen a full episode. I've only heard of them, and that's all I need. Why, why put that? Oh, why even let those kind of things in your head? These people, you know, these, I don't know how many women living together, and they're all a wife to one husband. Nobody, that's not right. It's not biblical. It's not right. So whatever. I hope I didn't offend anybody. I didn't mean to. I figured everybody here would, uh, especially all the women, I thought you would be for what I said. But anyway, you never know. Uh, but in first, Second Chronicles, let me just paraphrase. Um, and I, I hope I didn't blow any guy's plans uh, by saying that. But anyway, <laughs> dang it, you know. Just let me tell you, the end of it is not good. So it ain't pretty. That's right. You know, uh, the devil's pay is always the same. It's death. God's pay is always the same. It's life. Amen? Okay. So in Second Chronicles uh, 23, it says, thus, says the, thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Can, can I, I want to get further than this. Can I, kind of par- can I paraphrase, please, and tell you that Hezekiah got really sick? And God added 15 years to his life so he could live longer. And during this time, uh, there were heathen kingdoms that sent him gifts and stuff like that. And Hezekiah, when he came back into power, he reinstituted worship. And when he did that, people began to give into the temple, into the kingdom in huge amounts. So much so, Hezekiah asked his priests one day, are, are the people suffering because they've given so much? And the priest's response was, no, they have more than they've ever had. And so Hezekiah had a lot going on. Then he got sick, and the Lord extended his life. And then Isaiah comes to him in 2 Kings 20, and uh, he, he asks him, he said, why did you call in all these other kings, and what did you show them? Now, if anybody, everybody ever got, well, I'm sorry, I'm a guy, what can I say about women? Um, You've gotten something new. What, what, purse. Uh, women like purses, I guess. And, and so some do, some don't. But just go along with me. And so for a guy, it would be a gun or something. I've got a new gun, and I want to show people because it's, you know, it's something new. It's something cool. Trucks or purses or whatever other things, shoes, women like. And so, um, but Hezekiah brought, and it's okay to show people new stuff. I'm not saying that that's wrong. But Hezekiah brought all these leaders in and showed them everything in his kingdom. Now, if you've got half a brain, you don't show opposing kingdoms and kings what all you got. That'd be like a bank manager saying, man, I got the biggest, baddest bank and, and letting a crook come in and say, let me show you this. And, oh, you need the code? Let me show you how to get in. This was foolish. And Isaiah all but said this was foolish. And because you did this, yes, your life is extended But he says this, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all, all that's in your house and what your fathers have accumulated till this day shall be carried to Babylon, which was the enemy. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. These are children he doesn't have yet. And they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. That means they are going to be humiliated. They are going to be nonproductive. They will be slaves for the rest of their life. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word which you have spoken is good. For he said, Will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Let that sink in just for a second. Pride leads you to only think about you and not about your future. We've got to think about our children's future. We cannot only think about where we are and how life benefits us, right? Okay, so Proverbs 27, 20 says, Sheol, the place of the dead and the bad and the underworld are never satisfied, nor the eyes of man ever satisfied. The refining pots for silver and the furnace for gold to separate the impurities of the metal, the stamped and each is tested by the praise given to him and his response to it, whether humble or proud. In the Amplified it says that. It? I mean, that's really good. Because each one of us, you know, uh, people will come up and they'll, they'll compliment me on a sermon or it hadn't happened lately, but <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I'm, listen, I'm just playing. I don't, if you live by the praises of men, you'll die by their criticism. Okay, Bill Johnson said that. It's the third time I've given him credit, so no more credit for Bill Johnson. All right. But 
when someone says how good you are at something, I mean, just, they just go on and on about how good you are. You know, you're a coach or you're a, a school teacher or you're, you're, you know, metal. You work in metal and you're just anointed for it. And people go on and on and on about how good you are at that. Let me tell you something. You need to remember it's only by the grace of God that you have any good in you. And so you, you, you remember that. And don't be rude and say, well, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. It's God. Well, you need to shut up because that's false humility. You, what you're really saying is, yeah, I'm pretty good, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, God, you did, you know. You know, it's just we need to remember that God gives us grace to grow, but we must grow in power and humility. Amen. And so when people have said, you know, man, that message was just for me or this and that. I said, praise God, man. That is so awesome. I'm glad. Did you, and people sometimes, you know, uh, did, uh, did you know something about what was going on in my life? You know, and they, they think that, you know, I've got some hidden cameras around or whatever. I don't have any idea, but Holy Spirit knows everything. He knows what people need. But usually when I walk away, I'm graceful and I say, thank you. I appreciate that. God's good. Uh, I'll, I'll, under my breath, I'll walk away and say, God, I know, I know, I know me. And I'm grateful that you gave me revelation or whatever. And you say that in your own life with whatever it is. And you just give God praise and God thanks and for being a, a good plumber or a good electrician or a good counselor or whatever it is you do in your life. Amen? Because we always got to give the praise to God. And when people give you praise, it's a test in your life to see if you will be proud or you'll be humble. It's a test. But you're going to want to pass the test, all right? James 4, 5, James 4, 5, we're getting ready to close. James 4, 5, this is really a good one. Um, and I've just got one more scripture after that, and then we'll, we'll go a little further next week. Or do you think that the scripture says at no purpose that the human spirit which he has made to dwell in us lusts with envy? But he gives more and more grace through the power of Holy Spirit. I know the Bible says the Holy Spirit a lot. Um, he, he is a he, not a thee. Uh, I have a message out there called the best, he's the best friend, Holy Spirit. And one of the very first things I tell people, it's not, and, and I know some people get sideways with me because the Bible says the Holy Spirit, but you got to understand he's a person. And, and I wouldn't, if Carl was my best friend, and he's a good friend, but if he was my best friend, I wouldn't walk up to Amy and said, Amy, I want you to be my best friend, the Carl. <laughs> Why? Because I've reduced him to a thing instead of a person. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the church has reduced Holy Spirit to a thing or to just power rather than being a person who walks with us. Amen. And he goes on to say, but he gives more and more grace through the power of Holy Spirit to defy sin and live an obedient life that reflects both our faith and our gratitude for salvation. If you don't get anything else tonight, this scripture has so much in it that, that you, if you just read it and, and, and meditate on it, it's going to give you some great revelation. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud and haughty, but continually gives the gift of grace to the humble who turn away from self-righteousness. So submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he'll flee from you. Come close to God with a contrite heart, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your unfaithful hearts, you double-minded people. Yeah, this is really nice, some stuff he's saying here. James is writing to the church, to the, uh, James was called to the, uh, the Jewish people, I think. Is that right, Jake? He, James was called to Jews, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but he, he was called to people. <laughs> anyway, um, he said, be miserable and grieve and weep over your sin. You know, uh, he said it. You, if we live in sin, we should be miserable and grieve over it. Because grieving is not for a, a life, it's for a season. It should bring us to a place of repentance. Yeah. He doesn't, he's not saying stay there, he's saying get out of it. Yeah. Amen? Amen. He said, let your foolish laughter be turned to mourning and your reckless joy to gloom. Humble yourselves with an attitude of repentance and insignificance in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will give you purpose. Yes. Amen? Yes. That word there that uh, 
opposes or resists is this. It is antitasso, which means I set, now this is important, I set myself against. Resist the attack of. So God sees pride as an attack on his character. Anti means opposite to or against. And tasso is arrange or order. So what we're doing when we operate in pride is operating against the arrangement and order of heaven. Properly squared off. I want to tell you, you do not want to be squared off with God. That's just not smart. Opposed to in principle and practice to disagree and oppose intensely. This is important. We do not want to be against the purposes and plans of God. And as long as we walk in humility, we are walking with him in agreement, not against him in disagreement. Now the reason, and another uh, translation of resist is hold at an arm's length. In other words, anybody ever been stiff-armed? Well, that's how God has to treat pride, with a stiff arm. Because, and, and it's actually mercy that he does it. Because if you with a pride, if me with a prideful heart gets too close to holy, I will die. Because everything that gets close to holy must be holy. Now, we've been called to be holy as he's holy. And I guarantee you, holy holds hands with humility. Amen. Amen? Amen? Okay. All right. One more scripture I told you. The Holy Spirit gives us strength to stand against evil desires. And this is a reason for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You know, we could talk about Holy Spirit until Jesus comes back and it'd be plenty to talk about. Holy Spirit is so wonderful, so beautiful, such a good friend, so powerful. You want, he is, get this, Holy Spirit is the most powerful agent in the earth today. Over every kingdom, and I've said it before, every, over every dominion, because Satan has no kingdom, because he's not a king. He's a thief. He tries to set himself up as a king, but he's not a king. We saw how that turned out. He got thrown to earth and didn't know he was even thrown to earth until he was thrown to earth. It happened so quickly and so violently. That's how you, you see that he was lifted in pride and bam, he fell down. He just came down so quickly. That's how God has to deal with that. Because, see, he wants to give you the very thing you're being prideful over as long as you're walking humility that he gave it to you. Remember 1 Timothy said he gives us all richly things. He gives us richly things to enjoy. But we need to remember what the source of those things is, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then um, the last one, Obadiah 1, 1 through 5. A direct reflection. Now listen to this before we go there. A direct, re I think I have this on my thing. Uh, a direct reflection. According to, okay, this is good. According to the definition of pride, it's, it is always lies. It always involves lies. Why? Because remember we looked at last week the definition of pride. One of those was conceit, puffed up, surrounded in smoke. Right. Well, if you tell somebody you know where you're going, but there's smoke all around you, you're lying. You don't have any idea where you're going. And you know, the further we go in this, we'll do some identifiers of pride. A direct reflection of the world and Satan is pride, while a direct reflection of the Father is true humility. Yeah. Okay? What's the, what we got next, Mike? Pride must die. Oh, this, these are two great ones, okay? These came, this came from, uh, who, who wrote the book, Humility? Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray. Okay. If you haven't, thank you. If you haven't got that book, it's, it's like a, a, read it in an hour. It's called Humility. Imagine, humility. You know why people don't write books on pride and humility? Because they don't sell. Because <laughs> people are too proud to buy them. <laughs> and they're the ones that need them. And so anyway, get that book. You can get it on Amazon probably for a dollar. Good gracious. I mean, it is so good. Pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live through you. 
Isn't that, isn't that, that's big. That's big. Go to the next one. Pride is not just an unbecoming temper or humility, a decent virtue. One is death. The other is life. One is all hell. One is all heaven. Andrew Murray said that. Man, that's so good. Okay, and the, oh, we must humble ourselves. God won't do it for us. He simply gives us the time to do it on our own. Then he steps in and, and becomes supreme commander of your life. See, he won't be supreme commander of your life unless you invite him to be. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. When you invite him to be, you better be ready to give all to him. Yeah. Because he doesn't come to be the Savior and Lord of some of your life. He wants to be Savior and Lord of all your life. Okay, what do we have next? Because I've got to get to that scripture here. Uh, no, let's go to Obadiah. Because it's a really good scripture, I think. We're, though you, yeah. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. They, we have heard tidings from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent forth among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against Edom for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations, Edom. You shall be despised exceedingly. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Now, this was a whole nation. Have we seen nations raise up in pride and act like they got it all together only to fall later? I mean, let's, let, look, let's look at France. Let anybody in, act like we got it all together, and what happens? There's rot from within. Okay, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You dweller in the refuges, refuges of rock, of the rock or Petra, Edom's capital, whose habitation is high, who says in his heart, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you mount on high as the, as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. We do not want to be like Edom was, high and lifted up in their own estimation, surrounded in smoke. Because what happens when you get in pride, it's kind of like when you, I keep using wives and husbands as an example, but how many of you husbands will be honest with me and tell me that you knew you were about to get in a fight, but you believed you were right, and so you just went ahead with it? I'm the only on two, three, four. I got five honest men in here. Thank you. Yeah, can I? One, two, three, four, five. Just the end of the night. Come on. You mean, you know, it's true. <laughs> By God, she ain't going to tell me what to do. I'm right. devil Satan it's his language but I'm not going to say anything I'm going to let things settle down I'm not going to talk while I'm in a cloud of smoke I'm going to love my wife even though it's hard <laughs> I'm going to love my wife by faith heaven and you will see the reflection of those two domains in your house, depending on how you respond. Everybody stand up. All right. Glory to God. God's good, amen. Uh -huh.